This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. I, I was riding with a friend of mine past a theme park near where I live, and they have a roller coaster. He remarked, it looks like it's bigger than it used to be. And he said, it doesn't matter because they'll never get me on that thing. Well, well I feel like that myself. <laughs> I have no intention of getting on a roller coaster because it turns you upside down. But I got to thinking, I live in a world like that, don't I? I'm living in an upside down world. That's what we want to talk about today. Why is our world so upside down? What can we do to make it right? I'm Billy Lambert, the speaker on Getting to Know Your Bible, and I'm happy to have you watching today. And we want you to uh, know that you are our honored listener today. Those of you watching for the very first time, we're delighted that you're watching. And we then have those that watch every time we come on the air. I thank you for watching. Now, we want to pause long enough to tell you about a free Bible correspondence course that we offer. And let me tell you, it's free. And, and we want to pause long enough. You can learn something about the course and how you can receive it. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580, or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. I'm reading today from the 17th chapter of Acts, and I want to read verses 5 and 6. But the Jews which believed not moved with envy, and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all of the city on an uproar, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring him out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren under the rulers of the city, saying, These that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Paul, beginning in Acts the 13th chapter, went on many, or at least three, tours, missionary tours. Actually, Paul made four tours because the last one was his when he went to Rome as a prisoner. But his first tour began in Acts the 13th chapter when he went out from the city of Antioch. But in our text today, he's on the third tour. He comes to the city of Thessalonica. And when he comes to Thessalonica, he, as was his custom when he would come into a city, he went to the synagogue. When he went to the synagogue, he began to preach about Jesus Christ. Well, wouldn't it be wonderful if everyone everywhere began to preach about Jesus Christ? Well, there were some that believed what Paul said about Jesus Christ. Then there were those who did not. And they became envious. They caused a riot. And they caused... Paul and his fellow travelers accused them of turning the world upside down. Think about the world in Paul's day. To, to, to get a glimpse of the Roman world in Romans, the first chapter, Paul talks about the world in his day. Starting in verse 18, he said, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven 
uh, against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, the, to the word hold in that passage literally means to, uh, to resist, or it means to, to, to deny. They were denying the truth. They had turned their, themselves away from the truth. It wasn't because they did not have any knowledge about God, because in fact, they did have knowledge of God. Notice in verse 19, he says, Because that which may be known of God has been, is manifest unto them, for God has showed it unto them. They knew about God, but they did not accept it. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen. We can see the invisible things. That is, you can look around you, uh, and, and see the handiwork of God. So the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so they're without excuse. There's no excuse for people not believing in God. It is my firm conviction that from the very beginning of time, to the present hour that all men have had the opportunity to know about God. Now, they may have corrupted their knowledge and they may have gone off into paganism, into idolatry, but originally they had knowledge of God, that there was a God in heaven. And then in verse, verse 21, he said, because that when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imagination, and their foolish heart was darkened. That They were out of the light, into the darkness. Now verse 22 is very telling. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. That was a world in Paul's day. The world in Paul's day committed every sin you can imagine in the catalog of sin. And Paul was trying to turn the world that was upside down in sin right side up. But when he came into Thessalonica, well, they accused him of turning their world upside down. Well, what about the 20th? first century world in which you and I live. What kind of world is it? It's a world of spiritual darkness. Now God is light according to 1 John chapter 1 5. God is light. He is the source of all light. James 1 17. He's the father of lights. But we live in a world that's filled with darkness. Spiritual darkness. Finally brethren Paul wrote in Ephesians chapter 6. Be strong in the Lord and the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers. Listen to him now. The rulers of the darkness of this world. There we're living in a world that is filled with spiritual darkness. And Satan and all of his cohorts in the depths of hell are working diligently to corrupt our world and to destroy our world. We, we live in a world of spiritual darkness. There is a danger. And the danger is that we become accustomed to the dark. And we become apathetic. We can't become accustomed to the dark. As Paul wrote in Ephesians 5 and verse 11, we're not to have fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. We live in a world of confused values. Have you ever thought about how confused our values are? Isaiah chapter 5 and verse 20 says that they call light darkness and darkness light. They call bitter sweet and sweet bitter. You see, it, everything is confused. It's turned upside down. 
And we live in a world today where our values are so upside down. They're so confused. We live in a world where life is cheap. Since 1973, when the, the, the law was passed concerning abortion, there have been in excess of 60 million babies killed. And we live in a world where might makes right. And that has led to so many things. It's led to murder. It's led to lies. People think it's okay to lie. But it's not right to lie. I don't care who it is. There is no individual who is big enough, strong enough, powerful enough, rich enough to get away with lying. It's a sin in the sight of God. And the Bible says in Revelation 21, 8, that all liars shall have their part in the lake which burns with fire and brimstone. And so it's a world where might makes right. People murder, they lie, they rape, and they're the persecution of Christians. We live in a world where we've allowed the clanging symbols of sin to drown out the cries of our conscience. You know, Paul in Ephesians 4.19 referred to the fact that some can get past feeling. And if we're not careful, we can get past feeling and our consciences become hardened and seared. And then we live in a world where we're bent on being politically correct and not spiritually correct. I am not concerned in the very least about being politically correct. I want to be scripturally correct, biblically correct. I want to be spiritually correct. In Jeremiah chapter 5 verse 30, Jeremiah said that a wonderful and a horrible thing is committed in the land. The, the prophets prophesy falsely. The priests bear rule by, their, by my, their means. And my people love to have it so. We're living in a day where people want preachers to tell them things the Bible doesn't even say. Paul spoke of that kind of a day, that, that day was coming when people would want to be more politically correct rather than spiritually and biblically correct. Why he said in 2 Timothy chapter 4, the time will come when men will not endure sound doctrine, but, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears and shall be, listen to, listen to this part of it, shall be turned from the truth and turned to fable. If there's ever been an age where men have turned away from the truth of God and have turned to all kinds of tales and fables and false things, it's the age in which you and I live. Well, someone may say, well, then, Brother Lambert, what in the world can be done about it? Our world is upside down. How can we turn the world right side up? And that's what we want to spend the rest of our time talking about today, turning the world right side up. First of all, you must have a benchmark. That's a place to begin. And the place to begin in turning our world in a right side up condition is to begin with God. We just begin in the beginning. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We begin with His Word. His Word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 12. We begin with God. George Washington, the first president, knew that. He said, It is impossible to rightly govern people, a people without God and the Bible. So we have to begin with God and His Word. We need to understand that, it, that, that it's in God that we live and move and have our being. We need to understand, as Paul wrote in Romans 3, 4, that God is true, but every man is a liar. We, we need to understand, according to Jeremiah 10, that the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man that walketh to direct his steps. We need somebody to help us direct our path. Our steps. That's God. And we do that through the reading of His Word. Somebody says, well, I like the way I'm doing it. 
I'm reminded of Proverbs 14 and 12. There's a way that seemeth right unto unto a man, but the ends thereof, the ways of death. There's a statement made in the book of Judges, chapter 21, verse 25, that that is appropriate today. There the Bible reads, Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. That, That sort of describes the world, doesn't it? Every man is doing what is right in his own eyes. But we need to do what's right in the eyes of God. We do that by going back to God, believing in God, and believing His Word, and reading and studying and obeying His Word. That's the benchmark where we began. To turn our world right side up, we have to come to know that God loves us. All people all over the world are loved of God majority of them don't know that. But they need to come to the point that they know that God loves them. As a matter of fact, he told his people in Jeremiah 31 verse 3 that he loved them how much? With an everlasting love. I know you know this verse. For God so loved the world that, that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life so the the God loves the world God commends his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners Christ died for us God loved us when we were not lovable God loved us when we did not want to be loved we need to come to the point that we understand that we are loved of God and love so much that he was willing to give the only son that he had his only begotten Son, for our salvation and and to do something about the sin in our lives. But if we're going to turn the world right side up, men must be confronted with their sin. Oh, we don't like that. But if we're going to make things right in this world, we must be confronted with our sin. Isaiah 58 and 1 says, Cry aloud, spare not. Lift up your voice like a trumpet and show my people their transgressions and the house of Jacob their sins. Those that sin, we need to confront and rebuke. 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 20. Isaiah chapter 1 is a description of ancient world, Israel, but, but how like our, our world is that described in Isaiah chapter 1? He starts in verse 4 and says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, that have gone away backward, that, that have forsaken the Holy One of Israel, provoked Him to anger, why will you be stricken anymore? Why will you? But you revolt more and more. The more God tried to get them to do what was right, the more they revolted against Him. And then He described their condition in God's sight as a man that was sick. He said, from the head, as it were, to the very soles of their feet, they're just wounds and bruises and putrefying sores that are not been bound up nor mollified with ointment. In other words, God God saw his ancient people as one great big moral ulcer, one great big putrefying sore. And that's the way God sees sin today. We have to be confronted with it. And all have sinned, Romans 3, 23, and come short of the glory of God. And know you not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. We cannot go to heaven one day with sin in our life, sin on our record. Acts 3.19 says, repent and be converted that your sins be blotted out. We must have our sins blotted out. And our sins are blotted out when we understand that we are lost that God loved us and we're willing to obey the gospel plan of salvation. He wants us to be saved. 
and we are saved by the gospel. Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. You see, if we're going to turn the world right side up, men must hear and obey the gospel. And that was the answer to the, to the sin in Rome. Because Paul said in Romans 1.16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Listen to him now. For it is the power of God. The power of God. It is the dynamite of God, as it were, to save us from our sins. And we must obey the gospel. That was the answer to the problems in Rome, to the sin of Rome. And there's never been a more sinful place than was Rome. It was the answer in Jerusalem. Peter came preaching the gospel in Jerusalem. The people asked, what shall we do? Which is tantamount to asking, what must I do to be saved? But you see, he had confronted them with their sins. And, uh, and he let them know that the one they had killed on the cross of Calvary was none other than the Son of the living God. And when they heard that, they wanted to know, what must we do? And Peter answered and said unto them, Repent. Repent. They needed to repent. Why? They'd killed Jesus. They needed to repent. Why? Because they were lost. They needed to repent. Why? They, because they were sinners. They needed to repent of what? They needed to repent of sin. Repent. Repent. Is there anything else, Peter? He says, well, be baptized and be baptized. What is baptism? Baptism is a burial in water. It is a, an immersion in water. Baptism is not sprinkling. It's not pouring. It's water over someone's head. Baptism is... Is a, is a burial in water. So he said, repent and be baptized. Well, how many of us, Peter, every one of you, without exception, every one of you, by whose authority? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why, Peter, should we repent and be baptized? For the remission of sin. Acts 3.19 is a parallel to this passage. Peter's pe preaching, it's, he's standing Solomon's porch, and he says, Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. We need to have our sins forgiven. Someone says, Well, what does remission mean in Acts 2.38? What does remission mean? He says, Repent and be baptized for the, for the remission of your sins. Well, if you had cancer and the doctor treated you with various, in various ways and then you go back for a checkup and the doctor says, well, you're in remission, he wouldn't have to explain what that meant, would he? You, you would understand that the cancer that had been working in your body to destroy your body and your organs was was no longer working in your body. It, it was in remission. And Jesus Christ is in the remission business. He remits sins. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sin. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was the answer in Jerusalem. It was the answer in Corinth. In 1 Corinthians 15, Paul said, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which also you have received, and wherein you stand, and by which you are saved, if you continue in the things which I have spoken unto you. For I delivered unto you first of all. Now this was the first thing he taught them. Christ died for what reason? For their sins. Died for their sins. Then he was buried. And then again the third day he was, he was raised up from the dead. And Jesus, that's the gospel. 
the facts about the death and the bear and the resurrection of Christ. And we're to obey a likeness of that gospel. And that's what they did in Corinth. In Acts the 18th chapter, we read about the beginning of the Corinthian church. And in verse 8, the Bible says, And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed, and were baptized. Now remember, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Acts 8, 12 says, When they believed Philip, preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. They believed. They were baptized. The Corinthians believed. They were baptized. Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. So the gospel was the answer to the world condition in Corinth. What about in Philippi? Paul heard the Macedonian call in Acts chapter 16, verse 9, Come over to Macedonia and help us. In Acts chapter 16, starting about verse 25 down about verse 34, is the account of where Paul was and Silas were put into prison. And they were singing and praying, and, about, and the prisoners heard that about midnight there was an earthquake. And the prison door was open. And the prisoners could have escaped. And the jailer was about to take his life. But he was told, do thyself no harm, we're all here. And he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? He was taught the gospel. He was taught to believe. And he was taught to be baptized. For the very, the, 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 we're told in Acts chapter 16, and verse 33, 34, that he took them the same hour of the night, washed their stripes, and he and all of his household were baptized, and it was the same hour of the night. We can turn our world right side up, but we've got to get back to God and doing His will. I want to thank you for watching today, and I, I am just thrilled that some of you have, are watching today for the very first time. Thank you. Thank you so very much. And, and we want to invite you to visit the Church of Christ in, in your community. If you're not certain where it's located, uh, we'll, we'll find that for you. Just let us know. And also, pick up the telephone right now and call for the free Bible correspondence course. Do that without delay, and we'll send it to you. I want to thank you for watching today, and until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. Getting to know your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.